Okay, uh, Genesis chapter four. Genesis chapter four. I'd like to ask you to turn your attention to probably up to this point one of the most disturbing stories in the Bible. Uh, I say up to this point, we're really only in the fourth chapter of the Bible, and we have just come from the place of describing both the heavenly rebellion of Satan, of the earthly participation of rebellion with Adam and Eve and their choice to turn their back on God's commands and the consequence of it, which is disturbing. And we see that when we embrace uh, rebellion with God or from God, the consequences of it are real and dire. And I don't need to convince you the consequences of sin in our world today. We look around and we see it on full display. But the story is here, and I think what we will see is not just the consequences of sin, but we're gonna see the character and the heart of God to those who are deceived in places of sin. We're gonna see the softness and the mercy and the kindness of God that invites all of us in our places of brokenness and deception to come and find a place of covering and atonement and forgiveness by walking by faith in the Son of God. So we'll see a lot of these, so bear with me if the story gets a little dark, uh, but it's the Bible. I mean, there's stuff in the Bible that I'm sure you wished, ah, do we really have to go there? Do we, you know what? Whether we have to go there or not, the Bible goes there, so we're going there. Uh, and I believe it, I believe that there are things, and. By the way, if the story of Cain and Abel, which is what we're gonna read this morning, makes you uncomfortable, oh, buckle up, friend, because the Bible's a long book. And there's lots of stories that make us uncomfortable. And it's not things that make us uncomfortable that God calls us to avoid, but to confront, like sin. We don't just like, well, I don't like talking about sin, it makes people uncomfortable. We gotta confront it in ourselves. We gotta confront it in our brothers and sisters. We need to stand for what's righteous, and you go, eh, it might cost you something to stand for what is right, but the cost will always be paid abundantly back in full and measures that you can't even con uh, conceive of. So God's, uh, God's truth is worth looking at. So would you stand with me? We're gonna read Genesis 4, verses one through eight. And again, this is the word of God, and it is there for our benefit. It is there to reveal to us himself and even our own flaws and our great need of him. So let's read with faith out loud and together starting in verse one. Now the man had relations with his wife Eve and she conceived and gave birth to Cain and she said, I have gotten a man child with the help of the Lord. Again, she gave birth to his brother Abel and Abel was a keeper of flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry, and his countenance fell. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you. But you must master it. Cain told Abel his brother, and it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. We really do need to pray. So Father, we pray that our hearts would be open to the teachings of the scripture today. Lord, more than just being faithful to read out loud and together the things that you've written, Lord, we want our hearts to receive uh, your heart today. And so, Father, help us to see beyond uh, just the flesh and blood conflict that's in here and help us to see uh, the spiritual reality that is being uh, opened up to us. And Lord, also, help us to be honest enough to not simply see two brothers thousands of years ago who struggled and failed, but Lord, help us to see ourselves and, and be open to what you are speaking to us and doing in us and through us today. So, Lord... May the word of God be planted in us and may it bear fruit. We pray in this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. Friends, why don't you be seated? Do you ever read passages in the Bible and you end up with more questions than answers? No, it's just me? By the way, I'm gonna need a little bit of verbal affirmation today, a little bit of this. Like, do you ever read passages in the Bible and you're like, what's up with that? Like, for real? Like, are you serious? Are you joking me? Uh, or maybe you go, huh, what does that mean? What is going on there? You know, when we read the Bible, uh, if we're gonna read it with an honest and an open heart, there are a lot of things that we will be at the end of, we'll say, huh? I don't get it. And I wanna encourage you with something quickly here as a tool to help your faith grow in the years ahead. Here's the tool. I'd like to ask you that when those questions come to you, when you're reading the Bible and you go, what does that mean? Or what does this mean, all right? Not just what does it mean, but what does it mean for me? And, and you, you have these, I don't know the answer to this question. Would you write it down? Maybe write it in the margin of your Bible. Maybe write it on a notepad that you keep near you. Maybe jot it in your phone. And as you read the Bible, keep a list of these questions. You know, because it's often in our questions, look at this, that we meet God. We often think that it's just in the answers that we meet God, but I have found in my life, it's in the questions that we meet God. By the way, God is a God of questions too. God asks questions that we don't know how to answer. And he's not expecting an answer for us. He's expecting that we would find him. Uh, we see two such questions even in the stories that we've read. For instance, Adam and Eve, when they sinned. Remember, when they sinned, they ate the fruit and they discovered something peculiar about themselves. What did they discover about themselves when they ate the fruit? They were naked. Yeah, that's right. And they looked and they're like, whoa, how did this happen? We didn't know. Have I been this way all along? They ate, and then God comes to them and, and God says to them, where are you? Where are you? God follows up with another question. They said, we hid from you because we were naked. He says, who told you you were naked? Do you think God was looking for their answers to the questions? Or do you think God's questions were a means of bringing his truth into their lives? I think the latter is the case. God's questions and even our questions are a pathway for us to discover more about the heart of God. And would you be, if you would be faithful to keep a list of those questions that you have as you read the Bible, here's what's interesting about it. God is going to provide answers to those questions. God's gonna provide answers to your questions. You say, why would God do this? Or how did they know that this was what God was? Or, what does it mean when it says this? If you will write these things down and not just move past it, don't just read the Bible like a, an accomplished checklist that needs to be done. Okay, I'm caught up on my Bible reading. Read the Bible like it truly is an invitation to relationship with the creator of the universe, with the God of all gods and the king of all kings. Here's the thing. God will bring the answers to some of your questions at times through sermons or studies or teachings that you'll encounter along the way. God will bring it sometimes through conversation with mentors in your life or, or, or spiritual friends that are also pursuing God. How many of you have had God bring answers to questions that you've had in your faith through sermons, through teachings, through conversations with mentors or friends? Wait, can you just raise your hand for real if you can think? Okay, so that's basically everybody in this room. I wanna show you another way that God will invariably bring an even more satisfactory answer to your questions as you continue to be faithful to read the Bible. As you continue in your faithfulness of reading the Bible, the answers to questions that you had earlier become enlightened and clear. You say, man, what does that mean? And then you go ahead and you read and somewhere and like you're reading what Jesus said, like, wait a minute. I think that has something to do with the question I was thinking way back in Genesis. God's word is the greatest source of answers to questions that we find in God's word. Can I just say that again? Reading God's word is the greatest source to the questions you have about what God's word means. In other words, God is the most capable of bringing the right answers to your questions. Because oftentimes you might have friends that are as confused as you are. You might listen to pastors or sermons that are as messed up as you and I are. And if our reliance to know God comes through other human beings exclusively, 
we're in a pretty sorry state. Thank you for not amening too loud because it's somewhat affirming, but it's the other time I'm just wondering. You're like, wait, what did he just say? Was that like Bilbo's birthday where he's like, I like less than half, you have as well as you like, and I know I have more than, what is it? I don't remember what it was, but everybody at the end is like, what? What did he just say? Exactly. So, um, God's answers will be found in God's word. And uh, that's one of the things. So here's the thing I'd like to look at. A couple of questions that just immediately come to me in the context of this story. You know, Eve says, what did she say? She lay with her husband. Adam lay with his wife, Eve, and she conceived. In other words, uh, what transacted between Adam and Eve is the very same thing that has transacted between, that resulted in the birth of every single human being on this planet. Uh, Adam and Eve had sexual relations, and the byproduct of that was conception, pregnancy, and birth. And, and Cain was the result of that birth. Um, this is important. This statement is important, not because it even just sets the normative precedent of how birth and human life comes about. It's important. That's how human life comes about, right? It's not science. It's, not, it's God, and it's God's prescribed method of procreation. That's how it happens. Um, However, it's also important, and the statement is there on purpose because it opens our eyes to Eve's frame of mind. Remember what God told her in chapter 3, because of her sin, that there would be en enmity between her and the serpent, that they would be at war, that the devil and the woman would be at war, and the human race would be at odds with the enemy, but that God, remember how we said this, even embedded in Genesis 3 is the promise of Jesus Messiah. Jesus Messiah, who would come not as the seed of man, but as the seed of the woman. It, it, it points to, or it alludes to a peculiar birth of this rescuer who would crush the head of the serpent. That's what Genesis 3 was talking about. And so as we read here, Eve, in her mind, God says, the seed of the woman would produce the rescuer. And she's thinking immediately, she's like Mary, hearing the word of the angel, she treasured these things. She pondered them in her heart. She treasured them, thought about them often, as the New Living Translation says. I believe Eve was also thinking about the words of God often, about the promised deliverer and Messiah. And she's thinking, is this it? Is this what God was talking about? And when he comes out, she says, what does she say? I have gotten a man child. <laughs> it's a funny statement. I don't know if any of you ever said that when your sons were born. I got me a man child. Um, my wife has never said those words once. We have four daughters, and every time it's like, praise the Lord, we have another beautiful daughter. I remember going in for the ultrasound appointments for each of our daughters progressively. Our, our oldest daughter, Talia, they said, it's a girl. We're like, oh, rejoice. We're so excited. And, and we went in with the second with Jaslyn. It's, hey, uh, it's a girl. I said, I know. They're like, how'd you know? I was like, I just had a hunch. I feel like there's a trend developing here. We went in with the third one. I stopped the lady. And I said, hey, I know you're going to do this, but I'm telling you already, it's a girl. She's like, how can you know that? I said, I'm certain of it. I, I'm convinced. I know it. She does the ultrasound. She's like, you're right. How did you know? I said, well, we have two other girls at home. She's like, oh, I get it. And then with Ava, when we went into the hospital, or we went in for the ultrasound appointment, we didn't even bother. We are just like, just save the money. Just like, you pay us, I'll tell you what it is, and I'll, you can send the check later. Um, it's a girl, it's a girl. We ain't never gotten us a man-child. But when, when Eve says this, what does she mean? I believe that it is, it is expression of the hopefulness of Eve to see the promise of God fulfilled. That's what this statement means. Um, by the way, the name that she names this child, this child that she is hopeful to be the promise of God, what is the son's name? Cain. There was a hesitant response there. You're like, it just doesn't sound right that anybody would hope that he was their salvation or that he was the deliverer. Uh, that's right. He turned out to be not a very good dude. And we ended chap, uh, chapter 4, verse 8 with like, and he killed his brother. You're like, that is not a good way to have your life described. But we see Eve... When she, he is born, she says, I have gotten, I have acquired, I have acquired a son, a man in the image, in the image of his parents. There is this, um, this thing that she says, the word that she says, I have gotten, is a verb, gotten uh, in English, 
but in the Hebrew, the word is kana, kana. Can you hear something peculiar about it? Kana, and what is his name? Cain, exactly. His name correlates to the very statement that his mother made about his birth. I have acquired, and that's what the name, that's what the verb kana means. I have gotten, I have acquired, I have received, I have been given. A man child, she says, uh, and his name is Cain, after the, the, the hope that she had of acquisition of the promise or the hope of God. There's a double play on, the, on his name uh, with another Hebrew word, Cain. Cain and Cana are, are related words. Um, one means to acquire or to get. The other, Cain, means a spear or a lance. And it's interesting how often in the Hebrew scriptures and among the ancients, the names that were given to children actually have much to do about God's purposes for their lives or even the character of their heart. And we see in Cain both of these words fulfilled. He is a man of violence, and he is also a, a man who God provided as the, the result of Adam and Eve's union. And so we see this. Uh, I think Eve's uh, hopefulness may have subsided slightly at the conception and birth of her second son that she names Abel. Uh, that sounds like a, a hopeful and a promising name, but the name Abel comes from the Hebrew word hebel, which means breath or vapor. Essentially uh, uh, understanding passing, transitory, meaningless, helpless, gone in an instant. And I don't know if that's what was being implied by his name, but it certainly doesn't seem to bear some of the same significance or hopefulness or of I have acquired or I have gotten. Uh, but these two brothers serve for us not only as kind of an allegory of conflict and of difference, but in the reality. This is not an allegory. This is not a fairy tale. It's not just some story. This is a real the real history of the real human race and the real first children of the real first people. And we see that even in the first family, the distinction, everything about these two boys is so different. From their naming, to their character, to the actions of their lives, even the, the, uh, the fruit of their, their labors, what they were called to do, was different radically uh, between these two men. And they display for us a lot. In fact, the Bible has a lot to say about Cain and Abel. It's not just in Genesis that we read about it. In fact, the, the Bible uses the backdrop of this conflict to illustrate a lot of other things. Um, for instance, in the book of Jude, much later in the New Testament, Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, another child of Mary and Joseph, writes this in verse 11 of chapter 1. He's speaking of false teachers who would arise in the end days, like we live now. He's saying these people who would lead others astray and do so for their own gain, these people that would lead others astray and do so to justify their own sin, he's like, they are bad, 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 bad people. And here's what Jude 1.11 says, woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, right? So false teachers who would lead people intentionally towards hell, have gone the way of Cain. So that gives us a clue about how God viewed the actions of Cain. And for pay, they have rushed headlong into the error of Balaam. You remember the story of Balaam, who was a, a prophet of God, who saw his gift of prophecy as a way to make money and to teach the enemies of God's people how to tempt them to sin. Balaam was, was a bad dude. And perished in the rebellion of Korah. Korah was another. He led a rebellion against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness, challenging God's uh, prescription of the priesthood. They, they, they shouldn't be the priests. We should be the priests. So these three, um, these three, Cain, Balaam, and Korah, stand out among the Old Testament uh, rebels as kind of the height of don't do that. Uh, there's a lot in the Bible about Cain and Abel. We'll look at a, a few of them. But I want to look at some of the differences between them, the differences between them. Uh, it says here that in the course of time, in the course of time, that they brought an offering. But before we got there, we read about who, what they did. It says of Abel that his occupation or the, uh, the spending of his days was he was what? Do you remember what it said? He was a shepherd. 
Well, more specifically, the Bible says that he, that Abel was a, um, oh, where did it go? I just lost my, my spot here. Again, she said, and, and Abel was a keeper of flocks, a keeper of flocks. He was a keeper of flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So instead of the name or the title of it, it's describing it. So a keeper of flocks, otherwise known as a shepherd, uh, indeed is what Abel was occupied by doing. The, I want to show you something interesting. Can you think of other people in the Bible who are keepers of flocks? Can you think of a few other names? Let's do this. This is fun. Let's pretend like we're old school Sunday school. And I just want you, to, I want some people to shout out different people in the Bible that you recall as being described as keepers of flocks or as shepherds. Who's got one? David. Whoa, you guys, that was in unison. Everybody shouted David at the same time. That's good. Indeed, yes, David, described as a man after God's own heart. He was the, from the lineage of the Messiah, was a shepherd. Who else? Moses, that's right, Asher. Come on, brother, you've been paying attention. Did your parents make you sit in the first service too? I'm just saying. Um, Moses was a keeper of flocks. Anybody else? Joseph, uh, Joseph's brothers. Somebody, somebody got it, the ultimate right answer. Yes, Jesus was a shepherd. Can I just say uh, to you, and, and we could go through, the fact that the Bible points out this early in the story that Abel was a keeper of flocks, he was a shepherd, is not just passing information. This is, if you will, a pivot point. It is an early indicator of those who would follow God's heart. It is, it is uh, an early indicator, an early leader of how God's people are to be led of what it looks like to be somebody with God's own heart. Um, the Hebrew word that it is used here to describe Abel um, is indeed the, the Hebrew word ra'ah, ra'ah. It means, it can be both a verb or a noun. It can mean either to pasture or to graze, like a sheep can do this. They can pasture, they can graze. Um, it also, as a, as a noun form, can be descriptive of the one who leads those sheep, the one who cares for and watches over those sheep. Is it any wonder, is it any wonder, as we listed just the names of people who were shepherds, who were watchers of sheep, who were the, those who would pasture or tend to the flock of God, is it any wonder that probably the most noteworthy and famous of all of the Psalms, Psalm 23, God himself is described as ra'ah, as a shepherd. David writes that the Lord is what? It's my ra'ah, the Lord. And it's not just, the, when, it's, when the Bible says the Lord, it is speaking the name of God. It is saying the, the Yahweh. You know, in the, in the first part of Genesis, we re, uh, referred to the Hebrew word Elohim, which is a title, it means God. It's applied in multiple places, um, in different places, even speaking of kind of the, 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 the false gods of the nations, the idol gods of the nations, the fallen gods of, uh, it's speaking as a broad title, but Jehovah or Yahweh is the name of the God of all gods. So when David says the Lord, Yahweh, he's not just saying God in a generic or general sense, he's saying very specifically, Yahweh, the God of all gods, the King of all kings, the incomparable one, the one to whom all others must bow, the one who created the universe, is my Ra. He is my shepherd. He carries, and David's description of that shepherd is pretty awesome. What does he do? He leads me beside still waters. He, he brings me into green pastures. He cares for my soul. He speaks to me, anoints me. I mean, this is the heartbeat of one who cares deeply for those in his charge. This is God. Jesus himself uh, is referred to as, in John chapter 10, verse 11, the good shepherd. I am, Jesus says, the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So when we see it described of Abel, we're not seeing that Abel is the ultimate and perfect, that it should have been Abel in whom Eve put her hope, but we are seeing that God is unveiling the heart of those who would consistently follow him. Um, it says that Cain was a tiller of the ground. 
Now, I want to be careful here because in no way is the Bible implying that those who till the ground are less than those who care for the flock. Um, I've heard this, this verse taught that, um, that, that it is perhaps Cain who did not obey God and he did not follow God's invitation and that's why he was in that category, that it was for lesser people to do that. Or, for instance, that, God's, uh, that their offering was accepted or not accepted for various reasons. But here, friends, both brothers were created in the image of God, were image bearers of Yahweh Almighty. Both brothers were met with mercy and grace. Both brothers had equal opportunity of walking out the purposes of God in their life. And both brothers, which is why it says, in the course of time, brought an offering before Yahweh. They brought an offering before Yahweh. Can I just tell you one of the questions that come into my mind? Because this is pretty early in the Bible. How did they know to bring an offering to God? You ever thought about that? How did Cain know that from the produce of the land, that, that he would, you know, the Bible says that from the sweat of your brow, uh, you would produce food for, your, for yourself. You would break, make bread by the sweat of your face. It's going to be hard work, but that's how you're going to eat. How did Cain know that from what he produced that he should bring it before the Lord as an offering? And how did Abel know that from the fruit of what was produced under his care, God should be presented with an offering? You know, not only were these brothers different by name, different by character, different by occupation, they were actually uh, very much different in more significant and substantial ways. Because all of these things are surface. These are things maybe that they didn't choose with, with the exception perhaps of their character. But where did they get the idea to bring an offering before the Lord? Both of them had the idea, by the way. Both brothers brought an offering before the Lord. Um, and it says that Cain was the first of bringing his offering before the Lord. Um, if anybody haven't had that thought before? How did they know to bring the offering? The Bible doesn't say God said to bring me an offering out of what you do. I just want to put before you, the Bible doesn't expressly answer that question. But it is worth us thinking about. Because later, later, as God would reveal more clearly about how Yahweh God desired to be worshipped, as he spoke through Moses, um, God prescribed that both of the offerings that were brought by both of these brothers would be things that he would be pleased with. Is God pleased with offerings of the fruit of the land? Is God pleased that out of the sweat and toil of your work, what is produced, you would present before him? Yes? <laughs> Do we need to take the offering again or something? I don't know. Yes, of course. And is God pleased, is God pleased with the offering of the, the first of the flock? Is God pleased with the, those, those offerings that he, call, he himself prescribed later to Moses? This is how I want you to worship me. Of course, of course. So it's not so much what they brought that distinguishes them. And I think the fact that they knew to bring it, can I just say this? I think God himself taught them. And I think one of the greatest clues of that we read in Genesis chapter 3, as Adam and Eve discovered something very peculiar about themselves, following their rebellion and their sin. What did they discover that they were after they bit into the fruit? They were naked. That's right. They ain't got no clothes on. And they were ashamed of it. Previous, they were unaware of that fact and didn't even know that they should be ashamed because there was a place of innocence. We talked about innocence. And so they, they were naked. And what did God do in response to their shame? What does the Bible say? The Bible says that God provided animal skins to cover their nakedness or their shame or the evidence of their sin. So what did God do? By the way, have you ever, anybody have any animal skins at your house? Anybody wearing any animal products, leather, anything right now? I'm just telling you, that animal wasn't merely involved in providing that. It was paid the ultimate price in order for that to take place. You know, an animal skin implies an animal death. And it was through the death of an animal that the Lord covered the shame of Adam and Eve. You see, that doesn't sound just or fair or right. Friends, there's a lot of things that we may not be able to understand at this moment, but these are the questions we need to write down because God will show us his heart later down the road. 
Say, how could the death of one, of one cover the shame of another? Well, that's a wonderful question that I think we can't come to the satisfying answer until we get to the part of the gospel where another innocent laid down his life, one who never sinned, who became sin for us. I'm talking about Jesus so that our shame could be covered. You see, even in the small details in the beginning, God is showing us his bigger plan. And so God uh, sacrificed an animal to cover their shame. And I believe that this lays the basis for Cain and Abel knowing that this is something that God desired. Um, so let's look at a difference between their offerings. What was the difference between Cain and Abel's offering? Are there any clues in, in the scripture that show us this is what's different about these guys? This guy brought veggies and this guy brought meat. The meat guy is better. And all God's people said, <laughs> not so fast, not so fast. Is that really what the Bible is saying? Um, no, they both brought, that's the verb, they both brought an offering, that's the noun. They both, the, their actions were the same, even though the substance of those actions was different, we know that God desires an offering of the fruit of the ground, and God desires a fruit, the offering of the flock. Both of them are good before the Lord, so obviously that wasn't it. I've heard some people teach that the difference between their offerings is it says that Cain brought some of the fruits of the ground. Just like whatever was left over or whatever like he brought. Um, and, and Abel brought the first firstlings, the first fruits, the fat portions, that which was best and brought it before the Lord and that's what made their offerings different. I'm not arguing that that's, uh, that's wrong, but I'm saying if we look more intently into the rest of scripture, I think we're gonna see something uh, more impactful to every one of us. Yes, it's important that we bring the best to God, but we should not just dismiss uh, Cain's offering because of what he brought. Because I wanna submit to you that the Bible itself tells us that it's not what he brought that was the problem. Look at Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11, if you have your Bible. Hebrews chapter 11, the fourth verse, it sheds a great deal of light on this very thing. What's the difference? Because the outcome is really important. The outcome of it was God looked with favor on Abel's offering, but he did not look with favor on Cain's offering. How many of you want God to look with favor on your life and what you bring? Yes, of course, we all do. Uh, this is what Hebrews 11, 4 says, by faith, everybody said faith. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain. Is it speaking of the substance of the sacrifice or the means by which it was brought? The means is what the Bible focuses in on. It is by faith rather than by flesh. It is by faith rather than simply by obligation. And this is one of the great differences between the offerings brought by Cain and Abel. It says this, through which, through which what? Faith, the which points back to faith the subject here, he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. How was Abel considered righteous? Because he brought a better offering? Well, partly so, but his offering was considered better because of faith. It was faith that Abel acted upon and that faith determined him righteous. God testifying about his gifts, and this is with reference to what we'll talk about in a moment, God looking with regard upon it. And through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. Though he is dead, he still speaks. Can I just say that the greatest impact of your life will be the faith that you demonstrate today. It will live longer than you live. Abel, though long gone, and his blood spilled on the earth, even then it cried out to God because it was faithful. It desired to please God. It knew that God was, was a righteous and holy God and that he knew he was unrighteous and unholy. So Abel, by faith, was declared righteous by God. So that's what we see the primary difference between their two offerings. It is faith. Um, let me just illustrate to you another way why, why, why you can look at this, not as how they brought their offering, but what inspired them to bring it. Because um, in general... Both of these offerings, both of these offerings are things that God would later describe that he desires to receive. 
Can I show you a difference between them, however? Perhaps a way that we can gain greater insight as, a, as the difference between Cain's offering and Abel's offering is in the nature of the offerings that they brought. In general, in the scripture, as you read through um, the Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy, God's prescribed offerings, uh, when you read the, you know, the, about the wave offering, the grain offering, the heave offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, the, you know, the, how many of your heads spin when you read those parts of the scripture? Like, ah, it's hard to keep it all straight. What is, which offering's which, and which, how much of this, and which of that? Um, can I just give you some generalities here? In general, in general, that every time that God calls for a grain offering or an offering of the fruit of the ground, it is to be a, an offering of thanksgiving before the Lord. In general, every time God says, bring me some fruit of the ground, bring me the fruit of your harvest, bring me grain, bring me bread, bring me, it is to be presented with this heart. God, we are so thankful for everything you've provided for us. When you bring an offering of the fruit of your, of your hard work, it is, it is a, an expression of thankfulness that God has provided all of it, right? So the grain offering, the fruit offering, the offering of that which grows is to express broadly thanks to God for how good he is. Is that worth expressing? Yeah, okay. Also, can we go to another category? In general, every offering of the flock, every offering which demands the life of an animal is an offering to cover sin. God asks for the offerings of animals, whether it's a sheep or a goat or a ram or, or a bull. God, the prescription of this is what God desires is to atone for or to make covering for sin. So this is what, and, and you read that throughout scripture. Now there are nuances within that, and that's an overgeneralization of multiple categories of offerings that the Lord calls for. But, however, we see that this is something that plays out. Cain and Abel never read Exodus, and Deuteronomy, and Leviticus, but they knew intrinsically that God himself demanded the life of an animal to cover the shame and sin of their parents. And I believe that one of the great ways that we see faith expressed on behalf of Abel is in this. Not only was he thankful for what God had provided, but he, he himself was aware that by bringing this offering of the firstlings, by bringing this offering of the fat parts of these animals, that he was indeed participating in the atonement and the covering and the forgiveness of even his own shame and sin. It is a humble heart that he brings before the Lord. We see Cain with a different perspective. Not that it's bad to be thankful, but he is being thankful as an obligation. And, and forced gratitude, have you ever had to express forced gratitude? April 15th is coming up, friends. You'll have to express some forced gratitude to the federal government as you pay your taxes. You know, forced gratitude is not the same as authentic gratitude, is it? So we can give, we can give gratitude with authentic faith, and we can also receive forgiveness with authentic faith, uh, but the Lord shows us, I, and I think the difference between those is significant, it is substantive, especially as we look to the rest of it. But I want to see um, here a little bit about um, the heart, not just of Cain and of Abel, but the heart of God as expressed in this story. Here's an important uh, thing that we, we learn as we read this story, that the Lord looked upon Abel's offering with regard. In other words, what the Bible's saying is, as Abel brought his offering before the Lord, the Lord received it. The Lord looked upon it, the Lord gazed upon it, and the Lord showed and demonstrated his favor because of it. What did that look like? I don't know. It possibly could have looked like what Abram uh, experienced when he put an offering before the angel of the Lord, and it was consumed with fire, and it was, it was burned up. And he said, whoa, that's how I know God was with me, and that's how I know God was pleased. Or uh, we see the similar thing happening with the prophet Elijah on Mount Carmel in this contest with the prophets of Baal. He says, let's put an offering out there. The God who answers with fire is the God who we know is looking on the offering. 
And, and he calls upon Yahweh again. Yahweh, the God of all gods. And the prophets of Baal call on who? They call on Baal, who is not the God of all gods. In fact, he is, uh, he is subservient. He is a demon who is subservient to Yahweh. And he has no ability or power to answer in the same way. So perhaps Cain's offering was not consumed by fire and Abel's was. Perhaps they understood that God looked with favor upon it because the blessing of God was upon the fruit of their hands. Like maybe it's, they knew that God was pleased because now Abel's flock began to flourish. And perhaps Cain was jealous of the prosperity of his brother. And that jealousy became a root of bitterness and hatred because in his heart he just wanted the things of his brother rather than the heart of God that was demonstrated through his brother. We're not entirely clear about how they knew God looked with favor on one and not on the other. But what we do know, and this is so clear and important for us to recognize today, what we do know is that God's response to this was first and foremost to Cain not to Abel. Can I just say this? God's uh, response to Abel was demonstrated by God's looking at his offering and his favor. But God's words, God expressly reaches out to and communicates not to Abel to say, hey, Abel, my man, you are doing it. You're doing it right. I'm so proud of you. Um, I'm with you in everything that you do. In fact, the Bible says that God first speaks to Cain. You know, it, it flies in the face of what our fleshly understanding of the gospel is. Our fleshly understanding of the gospel, which is not the gospel, is this. That God hates sinners and he curses them. And, and even if they come to him because they're so dirty and sinful, God will reject them. That's what we want to believe about the dirty, rotten, heathen sinners in the world. We want to believe that. And you're like, well, I don't believe that. Really? We act like we believe that. The way that we pray sometimes demonstrates that we believe that. Does God hate sinners? Does God immediately condemn sinners? Look, from the very beginning of the entrance of the word sin, by the way, the first, the first instance of the word sin is right here in this story of Cain and Abel in the Bible. God's response to, to Cain is one of mercy, is one of mercy. God speaks to Cain, and he says this to him. Cain, why are you angry? Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? Because we see that Cain, in realizing God, was, God and his brother were good, and that he and God were not good, Cain's response was one of anger. And I want to say this, that if you come to similar recognition or re realization in your own life, that you realize you're not right with God, the right response is to be upset. If you have come to a place in your life where you recognize God's not with me, you should be mad. Not mad at God, but you should be upset. It should agitate you. It should disturb you. Can I say a more dangerous response of Cain would have been apathy? Would have been one to say, well, I don't really care about God anyways. I clearly don't need him. He's never going to like me. That's not... Cain was irritated. He was agitated. Why? Because in his heart, he desired to be right with God. But in his life, he was unwilling to do what was necessary. And this is what God sees. And God tries to get ahead of Cain's destruction. God comes to Cain, even in the, the lead up to this terrible tragedy, and God warns him. Here's what God's first word to him was. If you do well. Will not your countenance be lifted up? Can I just say, this was God's invitation to Cain. He was saying, Cain, it doesn't have to be this way. It doesn't have to be this way between you and me. If you simply walk by faith, trusting me, believing me, honoring me with all that you have, won't it go well with you also, tiller of the ground? You don't have to be your brother to be right with me. You don't have to have what your brother has to be at peace with me, is what God is saying to Cain. He says, if you do well. In other words, that's righteousness. And Hebrews tells us that righteousness is obtained through faith. God is inviting Cain to faith. That's God's response to sinners. That was God's response to you when you were dead in your transgressions. When you were an enemy of God, he didn't say, get out of my face, you dirty, stinky, rotten, flesh mongrel. What did God say to you? 
God says, if you do well, if you do well, will not your countenance, will not your, will not things turn around? I believe we see the heart of God for lost and deceived people showing up in this story. The second thing God says to him, not only if you do, if you do well, it'll be good, but he says, if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. We see also in God, not simply an invitation, come to me, but a warning. If you keep going this way, if you keep persisting in your sin and in your unbelief, if you keep persisting in your greed and your selfishness and your jealousy, if you keep walking in this way, sin is right outside your door. It is never gonna be far from you. And you know what? Like Peter would describe sin and, this, and Satan later, he would say he's like a roaring lion prowling around looking for someone to devour. This is what God is saying to Cain. And he says it to all of us. You know this, that, that temptation and sin is never far from you. You don't have to wander far to find sin. You don't. You don't have to make a lifelong journey to find sin. It's right outside your door. And you know what it wants to do with you? It wants to do the same thing that Satan did with Adam and Eve. It wants to introduce death right away. It wants to introduce destruction and decay. It wants to seal, to kill, and to destroy. It's right there. And God is so good and gracious that he warns us of it. So many people feel that, that the preaching of sin is what keeps people away from experiencing the love of God. So I don't want to talk about sin because people might not want to you know, hear who God is if they're confronted with how upset or wrong they are. Some people feel like it's more gracious or loving to not address sin. But God doesn't agree with that strategy. You see, God's truth is one that confronts us. God's truth is one of those questions that comes to us and we just say, wow, uh, I don't know what to do with this, but I have to work through this conflict. God will address sin even at the very beginning here. And he addresses it even with us today. He says to, to, to Cain, it desi its desire is for you, but you must master it. There's hope in this passage of scripture, by the way. There's hope in this passage of scripture, even though it ends with such a dark, dark tone. It says in verse eight that Cain told Abel his brother. I don't, what, what do you think he told him? That's one of the questions I've written down. He told him what? He told him that God told him that sin is at your door and it desires to, to have you, or it told him that if you did what was right, I would receive your offering. We don't know what he told him, but apparently just hearing the word of God wasn't what saved Cain. Hearing it and ignoring it sealed his destruction, sealed, actually, Cain later in this very same chapter would be the very first human being to have the curse of God spoken over him. I said last week that Adam and Eve were never cursed by God, and that's true. And that is God's true desire for their children as well. But because of their insistence on ignoring the word of God, Cain willingly walked into the place of God's curse. He told his brother, and it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. What do you think the next thing that happened in the story, the first thing God said to him is what? Cursed are you, Cain. No, in fact, we see another one of those questions. Where's your brother? I truly believe that in that moment, had Cain responded with remorse, with repentance, had he not done what was right, God would receive him. Yes, there was consequence. His brother was no longer alive. But God is the God of the living, not the dead, isn't he, after all? If the heart of the sinner turns towards God, God will always receive him. And the heart of the gospel is always to present that message of mercy. You know, God's approach to Cain was an invitation to repentance. All along, even after his sin. Before his sin, it was warning, it was invitation to relationship. After his sin, it was a warning and an invitation to rest restoration. It was ra rather than just swift punishment, lightning bolt from heaven, zap, you're dead, Cain. In fact, did God kill Cain? 
Read the rest of Genesis 4, and you'll see God did, neither did God kill Cain, nor did he permit anyone else to kill Cain. In fact, God put a mark upon Cain so that no one else would kill him, because Cain was afraid. Now that I've been kicked out of your presence and your favor, I'm, people are just going to come and try to kill me. God says, no, 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 no. No, I'm going to give you a long life of opportunities of mercy. But we see his character repeated and repeated and repeated. We see in this warning ahead of time, God's warning ahead, which that is what he does for us. Listen, I want to say something about the heart of God. God is more merciful than we could ever imagine. God is more merciful, giving chance upon chance upon chance upon chance to the worst of the worst. God is more merciful than you could ever imagine. When you see so quickly that it's time to deal out justice and judgment and wrath and punishment, and you're like, God, where are you? You know where God is? He is on the mercy seat. He is waiting. He is delaying. He is patient. His mercy is seeking every last avenue for every last sinner to hear the word and the work of God. Not only is God more merciful than we could ever imagine, but be careful, friend, because God is also more just than we could ever imagine. And do not mistake God's mercy for God's weakness or God's willingness to overlook sin. I want to read this scripture as we get prepared to pray and get done here. So uh, if somebody wants to come to the keyboard, that'd be awesome. Look at this verse in 2 Peter 3. 2 Peter 3, verse 8, it says this, But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. In other words, time for God is not the same thing as time for you and I. So you being patient may last days or years. God being patient, how long can that last? That's the implication here. Continue in verse 9. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Friends, even Cain, even murderers, even the worst and the most vile among us have before them an opportunity of repentance. Should they turn from their wicked ways? Should they receive the atoning offering of Jesus Christ to cover the sins of their life? Will not the judge of the universe do what is right? God's mercy comes to us in God's patience. Verse 10 says, but the day, and here's where the justice comes in. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Listen, there will be many on that day crying, that's not fair. What did I ever do to deserve that? There will be many on that day accusing God of being unfair. But friends, God is more just than we can ever imagine. But today is not the day of justice in, in God's eternal sense of punishment. Today is the day of God's mercy. Today is the day that God has sent us as agents of mercy, as ambassadors of righteousness and of faith. In the last verses before we pray together, it says, since all of these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Friends, the story of Cain and Abel is the invitation to repentance, it's the invitation to look for God's promises, and it's the, it's the invitation and warning to avoid the wrath of God by living in his son, Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus, as we've already mentioned, is that great sacrifice that covers the sin of all. And if you would receive him today, will not your countenance be lifted up? If you would do what is right, and walk in righteousness, not of your own effort, 
but what Jesus has already accomplished. Would you pray with me? Father, we just come to this place in this time acknowledging your faithfulness, your goodness to us. God, we wanna come also being honest that we see a little bit of Cain in our own heart as well. We can hear the growls of sin crouching at our door. Lord, all of us, even in this week, have recognized times where we have failed and fallen short. God, would you put within us eyes to see, like your scripture says, the way out of every tempting situation, that you will not tempt us beyond what we can bear, but in every situation you provide a way out. So God, we pray that you'd help us to see that. But before we attempt to live our lives in the right way, we just come before you, recognizing our state of helplessness and our deep need of the forgiveness and atonement that only Jesus can provide. So Lord, we receive the covering of the firstborn of your flock, your son, your only begotten, the only one of his kind, Jesus Christ, who died for us, who rose again to secure our eternal life. We put our faith in him, and we ask that through faith in him, we would now be empowered to live lives that please you. So Lord, we rejoice in what you've done. God, help us to also be gentle and kind and merciful while speaking truth that may be confrontational at times. God, let us be guided by your spirit. Let us walk in faith. Let us walk by your spirit, even as we live among an unclean people in a land that is defiled with blood and sin and betrayal and murder. But may our hearts never grow hard or callous, but may they be like your heart, merciful, not wanting anyone to perish. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Friends, would you stand to your feet with me? I know it's a little bit longer today, and I don't apologize, but I acknowledge it. I'm working towards. But I want you to know this, that these are important days that we live in. And the most important thing that we can be doing is paying attention to God throughout our days. In our own struggles, in the struggles of the world, even as we pray, like we reference that we would pray with discernment, not just our flesh responding. God is good and he's calling us to follow him in the same way. And so before I release you, or maybe some of you wanna come and, and pray at these altars, that's fine, these will be open. But before I release you, I just wanna speak that blessing of God over your life today. And so would you receive it with the heart of a merciful and compassionate shepherd that we have? May the Lord bless you and may the Lord protect you. May he smile down upon you and be gracious to you. And may he show you his favor and give you his peace. We pray these things in the name of the Son of the Most High God, Jesus Christ, Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen. Amen. Amen, friends. May God bless you. If you want to pray, I'd be happy to pray with you at these altars. I hope to see all of you who are members tonight at our business meeting at 6 p.m. May God bless you richly. We're so grateful that you joined us here today at Cedar Park Church. We know there's a lot of ways that you could be spending your time, but we're thankful that you are here with us. And we pray that it was a meaningful time, that you were encouraged, that you heard from the Lord. That's right. And even though we're separated by time and space, we want you to know that it's important to us that you're with us today. And we're praying for you and believing in God's best for your life. And whether you're watching online because you're traveling or out of town, or maybe you're just checking out church, we would love the opportunity to say hello to you in person soon. So may God bless you and thanks for spending your time with us today.